Assalamu alaikum dear participants. So today we are going to discuss the Sharia of preaching. Uh, this is a chapter in Ustaz Javed Ahmed Ghamidi's book Mizan and uh, we will study this chapter in the form of a couple of sessions. According to Ustaz Javed Ahmed Ghamidi, as you can see now on your screens, uh, there are five basic categories in which this responsibility is imposed. So these categories, uh, and the first of these categories is the preaching obligation of the prophets of God. The second is the preaching obligation of Abraham's progeny. So we have been discussing this, that Abraham's progeny uh, occupies a very special status in the history of uh, prophethood because it was after him that prophethood was confined in his own progeny and uh, his two branches, one which emanated from uh, the prophet Ishmael and the other one which emanated from Pro prophet Isaac, both were given this responsibility, the, the, the progeny of Isaac being the first one and the progeny of Ishmael following after them. And, uh, and then of course this, they were gov governed by a specific law. And then we have the preaching responsibility or the obligation of the scholars, which is of course different from the rest. Then we have the preaching obligation of people who are at the helm of affairs, who are our rulers, and that too has a very specific, uh, specific implication. And finally, we have the preaching obligation of an individual, a person who is a common person, a common man, uh, who is living a common life. So his or her preaching obligation also has some specifics. So all in all, these are the five categories. And of course, uh, in the sixth instance, uh, we shall also discuss the strategy, or strategy of preaching or the program which has been given by the Quran vis-a-vis -vis how exactly this uh, noble endeavor should be, uh, should be brought forward and uh, this, there are specific guidelines which the Quran has given us. So you can see that it is evident that as far as preaching responsibility is concerned, it has these distinct categories and if these distinct categories they are not realized, if we are not able to gauge them and if we do not distribute and uh, categorize them the way they are categorized here, it will result in, uh, in a lot of confusion, it will result in obligations which are at times uh, additionally acquired and at times you might even reduce some of the responsibilities that you have. So today what we are going to do is we will discuss this first, uh, the, this first category which is the preaching obligation of the prophets of God. So we know that ever since the a birth of Adam right up to Prophet Muhammad. This is an era which is a long era. We cannot have a fair idea of the extent, the, the millenniums which have passed in this era. Uh, this we call is the prophetic period. And it is in this period that the Almighty sent his prophets and right from Adam who was the first prophet up till Muhammad وسلم, who was the last prophet, we had this prophetic era. And after this era, the post-prophetic era in which we are living forms an entirely different historical back. It has an entirely different uh, different historical background. So prof prophets of God, because they constituted a category of individuals who were selected by the Almighty Himself for the purpose of uh, conveying the truth. Uh, so therefore, they had a very very specific job which was cut out to them. Now the Quran actually mentions uh, the responsibility of a prophet and. Uh, in fact, while addressing Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the words of the Quran which actually specify this responsibility are Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadheera wa da'iyan ilallahi bi iznihi wa sirajam munira. O Prophet, we have sent you forth as a witness, a bearer of good tidings and a warner and as one who shall call men to God by his leave and as a shining lamp for the guidance of mankind. On this earth is that the Almighty actually selects some of his people for the conveyance of the truth, for the dissemination of the truth. And in the very next verse you see this responsibility is actually mentioned vis-a-vis -vis all the prophets of God. So it is said that basically it is this uh, responsibility of, uh, of bearing witness, of uh, bearing good uh, good light tidings and to be a warner, to warn people of the hereafter and warn people of the consequences of the hereafter and also give them glad tidings uh, of the hereafter if they follow the truth uh, is something which is a given. But uh, whilst delineating this responsibility in a general sense, the Quran says that Allah 
So mankind was once one community. Then differences surfaced between them, so God sent forth prophets as bearers of glad tidings and as warners. So basically, as you can see, that the need for prophethood arose because mankind, although at the start, they were one community, there was no difference between them. But as life went along, differences surfaced, differences became prominent. So the Almighty had to interfere and sent for, he had to send forth his own prophets so that they could be, uh, they could be uh, resolved and they could be given uh, the proper direction. So in this regard, uh, the Almighty says that as far as the preaching obligation of prophets of God is concerned, that is to convey the truth. And amongst these prophets of God, the Almighty actually selects certain other people who are called the Rasul. And for, for them, the Almighty says that it is their responsibility that they establish a miniature day of judgment on the face of the earth. So we have prophets of God, which are called Nabi in the, in the terminology of the Quran. So amongst those um, Nabi or Ambiya, the Almighty chooses certain Ambiya and elevates them to the status of a Rasul. And then these Rasul are given the responsibility of establishing the Shahada or this uh, reward and punishment in this world. So that as far as the truth is concerned, it becomes evident. It becomes so evident in this world. Uh, amongst the foremost adversaries of a messenger that they, if they deny, then this can only be because of arrogance. It cannot be, uh, it cannot be out of any confusion. So we have to understand that as far as uh, the Quran is concerned, it says that people uh, are told that if they honor the covenant with their God, they will be rewarded in this world. And if they dishonor it, they will be punished here. And the consequence of this is that these messengers or Rusul become signs of God. And it is as if people see God walking along with the Rasul who deliver his verdicts. And these Rasuls are directed to propagate the truth and deliver to the people the exact guidance the way they have received it. So uh, the words which are used by the Quran are Li Allah yakuna linnasi hujjatum ba'da Rasul. So that mankind, after the coming of these messengers, is left with no excuse against the Almighty. So this is, the, uh, this is the ultimate effect of the coming of a messenger of God. He conveys the truth to such an ultimate extent. It shines, it shines like a bright lamp. It shines like the sun, the midday sun. It blossoms like a flower uh, whose fragrance cannot be denied in any way. Such is the extent of this truth which is delivered. And once this happens, uh, the Almighty uh, is able to deliver it in a way that only people who are adamant, who are bent upon denying it, only they do so. Otherwise, as far as the truth is concerned, it becomes evident to every single person of this world. Now, as far as the, uh, as the nature of this, uh, this uh, dissemination of the truth is concerned, uh, you can clearly see that uh, delivering warnings and glad tidings by, by the Ambiya, it does not require any explanation because basically what they are doing is they are establishing uh, or they are conveying whatever wahi or revelation they get. However, as far as the Rasul are concerned, remember I just said that the Rasul is a category uh, which is chosen from among the prophets. So not every, uh, not every Rasul, I mean, not every prophet is a Rasul. So Rasul is a, is, a, is a very specific category. It is like saying that we have, uh, I mean, just to give an ordinary example, that if there are soldiers, that so every soldier can be, uh, elected or maybe uh, it, he may be uh, elevated to the position of a, of, a, of a general. So every general is a soldier, but not every soldier can become a general. So on, on similar lines, every prophet cannot become a Rasul, although all Rasuls are prophets of God. So a Rasul is a cadre, is a, is a step ahead, a category above the, uh, the, the, the Nabi or the prophet. So the English language, we generally use the word prophet for Nabi and we use the word messenger for Rasul. So this distinction has to be made. So as far as this, uh, the, the Rasul are concerned, now their preaching passes through a particular phase. And these phases, it's not just one phase, these are various phases in which the life of a messenger, if you can study, if you study from the Quran, it is divided. And these phases can be clearly seen in the Quran. 
that is, there is a there is a particular sequence in which a rasul of god a messenger of god delivers the truth it's not that he does it in an abrupt way it's not that he does it in a in sequential way no he does it in a very sequential way and these phases have been identified uh, by ustaz javed ahmed ghamidi in his book uh, and i will i will try to explain these phases so once a rasul is commissioned so to speak once he is called to uh, to uh, begin his preaching endeavor he starts off the, with the very first phase and this is what is called inzar inzar is an arabic word for warning so he preaches his message and warns his adversaries and he tells them that as far as this world is concerned it is going to end one day and uh, rasul uh, will tell them once that as far as those who reject this rasul uh they will they will be punished not only in this world but also in the hereafter for so therefore a rasul actually warns his nation of two types of punishment one in this world which i just discussed that they will be given this punishment in this world and the other which is going to take place in the hereafter so these rasul inform their people that they have been sent in this world to set up a miniature day of judgment so a smaller day of judgment a lesser day of judgment is going to be set up by them in this world and once they have communicated the truth to their adversaries in a manner that they are left with no excuse to deny it they will have to face this punishment in this very world so as far as uh, this warning is concerned as far as this inzar is concerned if you would like to see a glimpse of how prophets of god warned their nations one of the best examples in fact one of the best samples in this is uh, surah kamar which is the 54th word, uh, surah of the quran and here you can see how this anzar is meted out uh, by by prophets of god by messengers of god in a way that first of all as they start the the scope of this warning is limited to their own families it's basically their own immediate families and in the next step uh they actually enhance the scope and this next step is called by the quran, by by the quran is as inzari am and this has been actually uh demarcated as a phase by ustaz javed ahmed ghamidi in his book and the way the quran expresses them is ya ayuhal mudassir kum fa ansir it's like oh oh prophet stand up and now deliver this warning far and wide so in the first phase as i said uh the scope of this warning is limited it's just confined and it is generally confined to the immediate family and uh, or to a narrow circle of the, of the messenger himself but it is generally addressed in a way that you have to understand that it permeates the whole the whole family it permeates the immediate and uh, immediate surroundings of of a messenger of god once this is done uh, then we find the scope of this warning is enlarged it is enhanced and this enhancement as you can see is is also uh, evident from the fact that now the prophets of god now, now messengers of god they are required to increase the scope but before we go on to the next phase which is uh, which is inzari arm or or increased warning or general warning uh, you can see that as far as the quran is concerned verse uh, surah number 67 to surah number 72 which is from surah mul to surah jin these are the surahs if you study from their own text you will find out that they are the ones who constitute that phase which is the first phase of the of the delivering uh, of warning or the first phase of preaching and you might also uh, be surprised to note this that everywhere in the whole of the quran if if you gather all the surahs of the quran all the chapters of the quran this is the only chapter which is chapter number 7 which actually has surahs which belong to the inzar phase to the preaching phase so you will not find these surahs in any other chapter of the quran they are just found in this 7th chapter and they start off with surah number 67 as i said and they uh, go on to surah number 72 and during this you can see that amongst uh, these surahs is surah qalam which is a 68 surah it mentions the parable of the people of the orchard and then while summing up the warning of the quran it says kazalik al azab wal azab al akhirati akbar law kanu ya'lamun people of mecca you are denying this rasul so take heed in such a way shall the punishment come and the punishment of the hereafter shall be much greater than this if this they only knew 
So, we have to make this consideration that as far as uh, Inzar is concerned, it starts off with the uh, with the with this message that people have to pay heed that if they don't pay heed to the message and the warning of, of uh, messenger of God then they are going to be doomed in this world however the the circle of this warning as I said is confined to the immediate addressees and, or the immediate or the foremost family of a messenger of God and then in the next phase this this broadens it actually increases in its uh, uh, in its style uh, the, the forcefulness also increases and you also find that as far as this Inzar is concerned that uh, people who are at the helm of affairs are, are generally addressed. So uh, uh, in the first phase also, I mean even in the first phase where the, where the scope is limited, even, there, even in that phase you will find that messengers of God, they generally address people who are influential, people who are uh, in a position of authority in the society. So you see Prophet Abraham at the very outset he, uh, he called to uh, he called upon his family and his clan and remember his own father Azar as he's mentioned in the Quran he held the reins of religious leadership and then he actually went to Nimrod and uh, he called upon him uh, and he told him that well this is this is something that you have to understand that if you don't follow the truth then you'll be doomed and it is it is the most appropriate thing to do because you see as far as the masses are concerned they are not in a position to make a decision unless their own leaders make that decision. Uh, you'll also see this uh, see the similarity in, in, in Moses because he was sent to the Pharaoh and remember the Pharaoh was the person who was basically in charge and he was the person at the helm of everything and unless he was wooed it was not possible for his followers and his clan to in any way have, have them convinced. Uh, very similar is the case with Jesus. So he was first of all uh, asked to present the truth before the scholars of the Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadduqis because they had that position of authority. Prophet Muhammad also asked his immediate relatives, the Quraysh tribe remember were the ruling tribe. They were the, pers they were the people who were at the helm of affairs. So in the Inzar phase also what happens is that prophets of God, they uh, address the people who are at the helm of the affairs, they do go directly to them, they give them uh, warning, they tell them that if they don't profess faith then this is going to be the, the result and that uh, as far as they themselves are concerned they are going to be doomed. So we are talking about the next phase which is the Inzari arm phase or the phase of open warning or general warning. So whatever is done here is basically meant to, under, uh, to, to underscore the fact now the, the, the scope of this preaching is, is increased and in the Quran this phase is actually uh, pointed out by the, these verses of this verse of Surah Musammil, which says, "Inna sanulqi alayka qawlan saqila." So the Prophet is being told, Prophet Muhammad is being told, that very soon uh, we shall soon lay on you the burden of a heavy word, which of course refers to the fact that now is the time in which you are now going to broaden the scope. Now, what was said in in private gatherings is now going to be said uh, openly towards people and you will to go to all sorts of people around you and because it is done in such force you know what happens if it is successful which is it is bound to be successful then it elicits a great, great reaction which is not evident in the first phase because you see in the first phase the preaching is confined it is limited but in the second phase it is done in a very forceful way and those who take lead in professing faith are in, in this phase are generally the youth they are generally people who, who, who take, take initiative and they are the ones who, are, who would immediately say yes that okay as far as the truth is concerned if we understand it we are not going to dilly dally we are not going to refrain ourselves from any such thing all that we are going to do is that in this phase we will follow the prophet we will follow the messenger uh, in, in a way that uh, people will realize that yes if the force of reaction is more then so is our resolve to counter that uh, to counter that force. So it is at this stage that the Rasul is also stopped from going after the arrogant among their people and they are directed to primarily concentrate on instructing their own followers. So you will see for example verses uh, like, the, like the one that is being displayed before you which is Surah Yunus's 15th verse it says when our clear affiliations are recited out to them those who have no hope of meeting us 
uh, say to you, give us a different Quran or change it a little. Tell them it is not for me to change it of my own accord. I follow only what is revealed to me. For I fear the punishment of a fateful day if I disobey my Lord. And similarly, uh, you can see that uh, when the messenger of God is stopped from going after, uh, after other people in this regard, after, after people who are not concentrating on his message, uh, then the words to the effect are فَتَوَلَّ عَنْهُمْ فَمَا أَنْتَ بِمَلُومُ وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الزِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Which means, for this reason, ignore them. Now you shall incur no blame. Keep reminding them, for reminding is beneficial to the believers. So you see, in the first phase, the addressees are of course the, the patriarchy, the leadership of the, of, which is of course uh, not only the, the religious leadership, but also the political leadership. And then in the second phase, when this is enhanced, when this, this force is enhanced, it elicits a very strong reaction. And people, when they see that the force is increasing and, and the messengers are achieving success, then they are faced with a wrath, with a lot of wrath and a lot of anger. And we know in the, in the times of Prophet Muhammad, this happened when, for example, uh, Bilal was subjected to a lot of torture and persecution. Ammar bin Yasir, uh, also we know the Ta'ala and, and whom, that he was also uh, tortured and persecuted uh, because when, when people think that there is a new order coming up, when they see that there is a new order coming up, they, are, they would not like the previous order to, to go away. And then this is how they react. And this reaction is clearly something which then signals the third phase of the preaching mission of, uh, of a messenger of God. And this third phase is called the Itmamul Hajjah phase. So the first phase was the Inzar phase in which things are going along in a, in a very, very, very confined way. Then we had the inzar Am phase in which the, 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 the whole momentum was increased and uh, so was the reaction. And then in this third phase that we enter, you, you'll, you'll see that as far as this third phase is concerned, now the truth has been conveyed to the addressees in such an eloquent way, in such an ultimate way, in such a, in such a final way that they have no excuse except arrogance to deny it. The only excuse that they have uh, is that they present their own arrogance, their own vested interests, uh, as, as, as barriers, as shields against it. And this actually means that now is the time when a Rasul is, is in, in a position to tell you or to tell his, his addressees that as far as their, as their fate is concerned, now they are going to, to be in a, in, a, in a position that they will face uh, the, the wrath of the Almighty. And in this particular phase of Itmam al uh, we can find two surahs, the way they convey, the, the, the tone in which they convey the warning of the Almighty is beautifully portrayed in, in these two surahs, these twin surahs, which most of us actually know by heart, Surah Fil and Surah Quraysh. Uh, we might have studied them and learned them by heart, but we do concentrate on their meanings and you'll understand the force they have behind them and the, 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 the very aspect that as far as the Almighty is concerned, how uh, to what extent he can he goes uh, for the truth to be conveyed. So the first surah is surah feel, and I'm just going to read its translation, and and just look at uh, the, the 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 style. Which it starts off. Have you not seen how your Lord dealt with the people of the elephant? So I mean, the, if you pronounce it in a way which which conveys the tone of the Almighty, it has to be in a way which which conveys that harshness. So have you not seen how your Lord dealt with the people of the elephant? I mean, there was something of the past that you all know. You witnessed this, this incident of Abraha uh, trying to attack the house of God and look what happened to him. Did he not foil his, their scheme? So the Almighty actually just decimated their scheme and sent down against them swarms of birds such that you pelted them with stones of baked clay and he rendered them as straw eaten away. So this is the final tone. This is like a final warning which is sounded in this in Zariyam and and you can see how effective these words are and they, they, they literally uh, cause us, uh, to, uh, our hair to stand on its end. And similarly, look at Surah, Fil, uh, Surah Quraysh, it says, On account of the association of the Quraysh, the association in the peaceful atmosphere of the Baitullah, they have with the winter and the summer travels. They should worship the Lord of this house who in these barren mountains fed them in hunger and rendered them secure from fear. 
So you see that as far as this phase is concerned, it, it actually has that, that ultimate tone in it, which means that now things have reached their pinnacle. So if I can make a, a, a gradient, a line, a climbing line, I can say the INZAR starts at the very base. Then we have things in, uh, in, in which uh, the whole warning aspect increases in momentum and we have the INZAR arm phase. And this culminates in the, in the, in the third phase, which is the Itmam al hujja phase. The word Itmam al hujja you can see, has, is something which has been derived from the Quran. We've just studied that verse, Allah yakuna nasi hujjatum rusul, so that after the coming of these messengers, mankind should have no excuse. So Itmam al hujja actually uh, is literally a, a term which means completion of argument, which means that the arguments which were to be presented or which could have been presented in an effective way by the Almighty have now been presented. So they have now been complete, they are now perfected and nothing remains amiss. Everything has been conveyed in its ultimate way. So if now anyone is, is still not accepting, then this is not because of any, any miscommunication. It's not because of any lack of information or, uh, or the fact that you are not able to understand anything in its proper way. Everything is evident as the midday sun. And in spite of this, now you have to understand it as far as the Almighty is concerned. He has done what best could have been done in conveying the truth after these phases of Inzar, inzar Yam, and Itmam al hujja the third phase. The truth is now evident. This truth is now no one can dispute about. It is, it is as it's, it's shining like a star, like a lamp. And if now they are uh, taken to task, then they should not complain. Now with this begins the fourth phase of uh, the preaching mission of a messenger of God. And this fourth phase actually is the phase in which, in which a messenger leaves his nation. He is made to leave his nation and this uh, departure of the messenger of God actually signals destruction for that, for that nation. And that is why we call this fourth phase as the phase of Hijra and Bara. So Hijra is migration and Barat is acquittal. So now at this instance, a messenger pronounces that he is now going to leave his nation to its own self. He is now being actually commanded by the Almighty. So the important thing that we have to understand here that in this phase, which is the migration phase, which is the phase in which uh, Rasul is going to leave his nation is something which is always and always conveyed by the Almighty. A Rasul cannot migrate and leave his nation of his own accord. Remember this happened with the prophet Jonah and the Almighty did not like him, uh, this act. So he was made uh, to, go, to undergo a rigorous routine and he was in the belly of the fish for three days. And then when he realized that he had committed a folly, he, he repented and he was sent back and then he resumed his duty. So as far as migration is concerned, it actually tells us that now the truth has really been conveyed. Everything that could have been done has been done. So you see, only the Almighty can do this. Only he knows when the hearts of every person is now in a situation that in spite of the truth, it is, they are not accepting the truth. In spite of being convinced of the truth, they are not, being, uh, they are not cognizant or they are not, they are not accepting it. And even a messenger of God cannot be aware of this. Even he has to wait for God's signal. So in this phase in which a messenger of God leaves his nation, it generally takes the play, uh, the, 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 the situation generally arises is that either if the messenger and his followers are in a substantial number and they are also able to gain a place where they have political authority, then they are sifted out from that place and give, taken to that place and then they are organized in that place and then that punishment which is destined for the deniers descends or it, it, it emanates from the swords of the disbelievers. And when this is not the case, when the number of the followers of a messenger is not substantial and there is also no place available for migration where a messenger can go and establish his political authority, then what happens is that the Almighty punishes that nation. And how does he punish that nation? He punishes that nation through divine disasters, through earthquakes, through storms, through cyclones, through tempests. But this is destined to come. But then this is the, this is the final phase. Before that phase happens, we have the Itmam al hujja phase. And in this phase, it is in this phase, uh, my dear viewers, that you should understand that the, for the first time in this phase that the 
messengers of God are now authorized to call their nation as deniers of the truth. They are called Kafirun. So it was in this phase that Surah Kafirun was revealed in the times of Prophet Muhammad when he said, Kul ya ayyuhal kafirun. Oh, oh, oh batch of disbelievers. Not before was he ever allowed to address them by this, by this name. So in this fourth phase came the time in which he, at the behest of the Almighty, actually said to them that now that you have disbelieved, now that everything has, uh, has been uh, conveyed to you, if you continue with this, then you have to understand that as far as the Almighty is concerned, he is not going to hold back now and you now deserve to be called with the title of Kafir. So it is only in the, after the Itmam al Hujja phase, it is in the migration phase that a Rasul is able to call, he is authorized to call his, uh, his, messenger, his, his addressees uh, as people who are, who are, who are Kafir. And remember, this is only and only at the behest of the Almighty. Today, no one can ever call any person a kafir in any way. So as far as uh, calling someone a kafir is concerned, we have to understand that it is only the prerogative of the Almighty. No one else has this prerogative. Now we come to the fifth and the final phase, which is I actually have, have, I have described them uh, already, but just to give it a final sequence. And putting it in sequence, we have the fifth and final phase, which is the phase of reward and punishment. This is the phase in which, as I said earlier on, that in this phase, a messenger has now left his nation. So either the nation is destroyed through divine disasters or it is dis uh, destroyed through, as far as uh, uh, the Almighty is concerned, through the, the swords of the disbelievers. So as far as uh, disbelievers are concerned, they have to understand that in this case, now there is no coming back. And if you are, if you're going to, to, to still persist, then this, this is something which is now going to afford them doom in this world. And one important thing that we have to understand here is that the Quran has made it explicitly clear that as long as a messenger is within, as long as a messenger is within, the, the, within his own nation, uh, they are still shielded from any punishment. And the Quran actually says uh, and tells us by, by saying these words, Ma kunna hatta nab'asa So as long as a messenger is within the nation, we are not going to punish, it, punish that nation because they still have the messenger. They have to, to go to a position in which they reject the messenger. They, they start going after his life that now he, first of all, leaves that place. And this, uh, this departure of his, the messenger now signals their death. So in this case, as I said, that as far as the nature of this divine punishment is concerned, again, the Quran makes a distinction. And that distinction is that primarily people who are polytheists, people who are polytheists, they are destroyed, they are decimated, they are wiped out from the face of the earth. But those who are monotheists or they are deviant monotheists, as you can say, they are not wiped out. They are, they are left, I mean, they are, they are allowed to live on their own religion as long as they live a life of subjugation. So this is another thing that we can derive from the Quran that as far as the, the punishment is concerned, this punishment is not always the punishment of death. Yes, for the polytheists, it is the punishment of death because as the Almighty says that polytheism or shirk is something he's not going to spare in, in the hereafter. And in this world also, it is he is going to punish people who are guilty of polytheism. But people who are monotheists, they are spared. They can live on their own religion as long as they live in subservience. So this is how you can see clearly that as far as the, the phase of reward and punishment is concerned, this reward and punishment came in the times of Prophet Muhammad in a, in a way that his also, his, his opponents uh, and his, his companions were divided into two distinct categories. And as far as these distinct categories are, are concerned, you can see from the screen that is being displayed before you, that as far as his opponents are concerned, they were divided into three categories. The Mu'anideen, the Muturabbisin, and the Mughaffileen. So don't get uh, overawed by these terms, these Arabic terms. Uh, I'm, I'm going to explain each of them, but it is essential that uh, you uh, are able to make out that all these three types of people or these categories of people were present 
in, uh, in amongst the prophet, uh, among, before the prophet or in front of the prophet, and they are the ones uh, with whom uh, I mean the prophet dealt with. So as far as the Monadin are concerned, they are people who are openly and vehemently uh, against the preaching of the Rasul. And once they see that it is becoming influential, uh, they, they really uh, try their best, their utmost to, to bring out, I mean, they bring out their venom, they bring out their animosity in a way uh, that they think that their own traditional views are now being challenged and now their own vested interests are now at stake. So they come out in the open. And however, there is, they are distinct from one another as far as their reality is concerned. I mean, their motives might be the same, might be different, but their reality is exactly the same. Now, the Muturabbisin are the ones who have adopted the policy of wait and see. So remember, we are talking about the opponents of a messenger uh, in the reward and punishment phase. So first are the antagonists. They are, they, are, they are just, I mean, they are there. They are going to fight come what may. But then there are other people as well, which we see from the Quran. They are called the Muturabbisin. Tarabbus in Arabic means people who are wait, people who are always waiting. They, are, they, are, they are see where the tide is going to flow. So they are people basically who are who wait and see whether there can be a compromise between the truth or not uh, and, and falsehood or not and whether uh, I mean they will wait or, or they will actually see who is going to prevail and then they would side by the one who is going to prevail. So they are the Muturabbisin and they are consequently they are named in, in this very way and they are always trying to strike a compromise between truth and evil and they are not in a position to make a decision for their own selves in times of trials and tribulations, they even utter a good wish for the Rasul in their hearts because they are desirous of this, this compromise, this, this reconciliation. But they don't have the courage in them uh, to openly come uh, in, in the open in this regard. Now, as far as the third category is concerned, these are the Mughaffilin. So the Mughaffilin are the ignorant people. They are the ignorant masses who are mentally and financially subservient to the prevailing system and in every matter obedient to the religious and political pundits of their time. So the third category, which is the Mughaffilin, they are the common masses. So they are going to follow their leaders. They are not going to take a decision unless their leaders are going to take a decision. And this is their typical attitude in the first phase. However, once their pundits start to openly challenge the preaching endeavor of the Rasul, the difference between him and these pundits and their character as well as the nature of arguments presented becomes prominent. Now at that time they become distrustful of their pundits and leave them and they direct their attention to the Rasul. So at times it, there is a change of heart in them also and these Mughaffilin, these ignorant masses at times they are induced to some bold and lofty feat uh, on their own part and they join the ranks of a Rasul. But then of course this is something which is not always there. So this is uh, the uh, uh, I mean the category, the, the three categories which you can see uh, as far as the opponents of Rasul uh, are, is concerned and are concerned. So we have the Mu'anidin, we have the Mutarabbisin and then we have the Mughaffilin. On a very similar note, you will have, you have three categories of people who are amongst the followers of a messenger. So we had three categories who are against a messenger. Now we have three categories who are with the messenger. Who, which is the first category? The first category is the Sabikunul of Walloon. Now the Sabikunul of Walloon, as the name implies, are people who immediately accept the message of a, of a messenger. I mean, they take lead, they take the initiative and they are so, I mean, ready to accept the truth that it is just a question of the truth reaching them. It's like fire being ignited out of them through a very small flash. It's, it doesn't even need any, any bigger, uh, bigger flame to have it ignited. So it's already there in them. All that it needs is that something should come up and they immediately accept faith. So these are called the Sabiqun. They take lead. And then in the second category, we have the Muttabi'un bil Ihsan. The Quran is also referred to them, the Muttabi'un bil Ihsan. So they are ones who, I mean, they are not as, uh, they don't hold such an initiative as the as the Sabiqun of Walloon have, but then still, they are one who are not as intellectually superior uh, to, to the, uh, the Sabiqun of Walloon, but they are still outstanding people in this second category. If they do not take the initiative in accepting the truth, it is not possible for them to stay behind once they witness the determination and outstanding behavior of their forerunners. So like, they are like following them, they are right behind them. 
and in their initiative in accepting the truth and bearing with the perseverance of life, it is always something that they, they shine out with. And then uh, in the third category, we have the Zorafa and the Munafiqun. So as far as the Zorafa are concerned, which they are people of weakened faith, the Munafiqun are the hypocrites. So they are people who, whose characteristics should be understood separately. So Zorafa are people, or the Zorafa is the plural of Zaif, the weak, who accept the call of Rasul at some point, in fact at times in the very first phase. It is their intention that they fulfill its requirement as long as they live. But since they have a weak willpower, they stumble and then recover again and again. Uh, they have the ability that every time they fall, they atone for their sins through repentance and continue their journey on the, on the path come what may. So they, are, they have this weak faith, but then they, they, dra they drag along and, and they are able to, to, uh, to follow the prophet or the messenger in some form or the other. And lastly, we have the Munafikun. I mean, they are bracketed with the Zorafa because their faith is also dwindling. So there are people who, because of this transient influence and sometimes because of their well-planned uh, well planned prank, become associates of a Rasul. So they are either people who have bad intentions or because of some transient influence, they, they get into this category, but then they come out of it. So you can see the Quran basically, when it addresses uh, this in this final phase, uh, the, the, the addresses of a Rasul, it divides them into these three categories. Uh, each. So three categories for the believers or the followers and three for the ones who are rejected. And in this way, now the stage is set that as far as the three categories of the believers are concerned, they are rewarded. Uh, the Almighty tells them that they are going to be rewarded in this world as well, being the, uh, I mean, they're spared with any, any ignominy as is the case with the, uh, with the disbelievers. And as far as as the hereafter is concerned, it is going to continue. This, this, this uh, favor of the Almighty is going to continue in the hereafter as well. Now, in the, in the, in the last part of my session here today, I, I'm going to sum up the reward and punishment which, is, which took place in the times of Prophet Muhammad uh, against his addresses. And this I'm going to sum up uh, by reading you parts of Ustaz Ghamidi's Mizan. Uh, and you'll see that how this final phase was set in the times of Prophet Muhammad. So remember, until now we have discussed the phases of preaching of a messenger of God. We have seen how they culminate in the phase of Itmam al hujja We have seen how after Itmam al hujja which is the third phase, it is followed by the fourth phase, which is uh, the phase of migration and acquittal. And we have, now we have also seen that in the fifth phase, once this migration has taken place, the stage is set for reward and punishment. And in this reward and punishment, we have these two categories, each having three subcategories. So with this summary, let me now read out before you how Stars has said that as far as this reward and punishment is concerned, how it took place in the times of Prophet Muhammad. Number one, all the antagonists and adver adversaries from the leadership of the Quraysh were killed in the Battle of Badr. It was only Abu Lahab who did not take part in the battle in an effort to save himself from torment. The Quran had already declared that he would die together with his supporters and comrades. Consequently, this prediction was fulfilled word for word and a, and a week after the defeat at Badr, this leader of the Banu Hashim was killed by plague. And such was the condition of his dead body that no one came near it till three days after his death. Ultimately, his body got decomposed and a stinking smell started to come out of it. Eventually, his corpse was placed beside the wall and covered with stones. So this is the first thing which has happened. The Battle of Badr signaled the first installment of punishment for the disbelievers. Although the Prophet never initiated it, it was a defense. I mean, it was like a defense because the people of Mecca had attacked. But out of that, the Almighty had said that once this attack has been made, now all the major leaders of the Quraysh, they, were all, they all died. You'll find that Utba, Shaiba, Abu Jahl, they all lost their lives. And the only person who survived was Abu Lahab, about whom we know that later on, he, although he didn't participate in this battle, but it was not very far uh, away, I mean, it was not long after the battle, that he too died of plague. The second phase. After the battle of Badr and Uhud, once the Muslims had been separated from the ranks of the disbelievers and took the shape of a distinct group, an ultimatum was given to the common masses of the idolaters of Arabia, as well as the ones among them who had adopted a policy of wait and see. They were given four months to mend their ways, after which they would be humiliated and disgraced and would not be able to find a way out in this world. So 
this final warning of four months was given to them. And this, of course, we know was later on in, uh, near the time when, the, when Mecca was about to be conquered and it was after uh, the, the truce of Hudaybiya. So, the third, the, in the third phase, at the time of Hajj Akbar, which is offered in the 9 Hijra, it was declared that once the sacred months have passed, Muslims would kill these idolaters wherever they find them, except if they accept faith, adhere to the prayer and pay zakat. Only those people would be an exception to this declaration who had treaties with the Prophet. Muslims were told that they should honor these treaties till they expire. It was obvious that from this that once these expire, these people too would have to meet the same fate as had been destined and declared for the, for the idolaters. So we had the battles of Badr and Uhud, then we had the time intervening, the battle, uh, these two battles and the last Hajj. And then in the final Hajj, in which it was announced that once these sacred months are over, these idolaters, they shall be taken to task. They shall be punished through the swords of the disbelievers. Now, we come to the fourth aspect, or the fourth important point, and that is that all the active antagonists, remember we had we studied that as far as the opponents of the prophets are concerned, the topmost are the ones who are the active adversaries, the antagonists. So, these antagonists uh, of the people of the book were also slain. So not only from the, from the idolaters, from the people of the book, they were saved, slain. One prominent example of this is Ka'b bin Ashraf. Uh, we know about how he was put to death because of his, uh, of, of his service activities. And he was also actively opposing uh, the, the, the whole scenario. So after this, it was directed that all their groups would pay jizya and live in subjugation to the Muslims. They were further told that if the decision of God and his prophet was not acceptable to them, they also would be massacred by his by Prophet Muhammad and his companions. So you see, this is divine punishment. This is divine punishment being meted out to the Quraysh, to the, to the people or the adversaries of the Prophet in the times of Prophet Muhammad in place of the cyclones and uh, other natural disasters which destroyed previous nations of God. So you can see that Prophet Muhammad and his companion, they became instruments of God's justice, just as in the previous era or the previous uh, messengers, this instrument of God's justice, what was what were this, this instrument? They were these natural disasters, these elements of nature. They were let loose on them. But in the time of Prophet Muhammad, because they were able to find a place of migration and they had become a substantive force, so now this punishment, instead of descending in the form of cyclones and tempests and, and other natural disasters, they took the form of uh, this uh, fight and attack from the hands of the disbelievers. The hypocrites, number five, the hypocrites were warned that if it would be better for them if they repented, otherwise they too would have to encounter the fate which was dest destined for the rejectors. So they would also meet the same fate. In the sixth point, those among the followers of Prophet Muhammad who were sincere but were guilty of some blemishes were forgiven after some punishment. And the weak among these followers were given the glad tidings that if they repent and reform themselves and remain on this commitment, then hopefully the Almighty would forgive them as well. So, I mean, this is something which happened in the times of Prophet Muhammad. And seventh, we have this, this aspect that the reins of political leadership of Arabia and the custodianship of the Baytullah were given in the hands of the Muslims who had taken lead in accepting Islam. In this way, the promise of the Almighty was fulfilled. The very promise which was stated in the Quran in these words, God has promised those of you who professed belief and did good deeds that he would grant them political authority in the land the way he granted political authority to those who were before them and he would strongly establish their religion he chose for them and replace their fear by peace. They will, be, they will worship me and serve none besides me. And he who again rejects after this will indeed be among the disobedient. So you see how the preaching endeavor or the preaching obligation of a Rasul of God starts off with this Inzar, passes through inzar -e -am, then through Itmam al then through migration and acquittal and culminates in reward and punishment. And this is the sole prerogative of a messenger of God. No other preaching category can culminate in this worldly punishment. And this is that practice which is 
has to be understood that it was a singular practice, a sole practice, a unique practice which, which makes the prophetic period distinct. So in this prophetic period in which prophets of God came, not every prophet, but those prophets who were selected as Rasul, they were given this task of setting up this reward and punishment within this world in their own lifetimes against their foremost addresses. And the way it took place uh, in the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad has just been described and summed up for you. So I will end my session here and inshallah in the next sessions we will study and discuss the preaching responsibilities of the other categories that we have just referred to. So I'm now available for any questions that you may have. So you said that سابقون, سابقون they rushed to action immediately. But we also know from the Quran that God asks us to like think and ponder upon things. So it seems like God wants us to think before we take actions, right? So if those people that rush immediately to action are praised, um, I'm just confused about that. Hmm. Like, why are they praised? Right. So actually, I mean, it's, I mean, this is something that is understood that I mean, as soon as they receive the messenger, or the message of the messenger, it is so close to their heart. I mean, they understand it so in such a blink of an eye, in a wink of an eye, that it takes them no time to get convinced because it is the call of their own heart. It is something which is their own soul is, is I mean, it, it yearns for. So it's like a vacuum which is being filled with that voice. And the, the, no sooner does it get filled that they have that urge to go forth. So it's just a manner of telling us that as far as they are concerned, that once they understand the message, they don't take long, they don't waste time. It is not that they would still see whether any person else is going to do it or not and then I'm going to follow. No, they rush towards it that as soon as that message comes to them, such is the nature of that message that it is simply the call of their own heart, the, the, the yearning of their own soul, that uh, it, it, it's like filling that vacuum in them. And then they moving forth and saying, yes, uh, we are there for any other uh, service that, uh, that the cause of truth uh, would require us to do. Uh, so, sir, the, uh, the last phase, which was the reward and punishment, uh, if you could uh, just describe for me again, uh, the punishment uh, for the three categories and the reward for the other three categories, what happened to uh, each of them? So, as I just described you, as far as the reward is concerned, obviously the nature of their reward would be different in the hereafter. So, these are the three categories which are with, with Prophet Muhammad, they are, they are there with him. As far as their worldly benefits are concerned, there is no distinction between them. But these, this, these three categories entail that in the hereafter, they would be dealt with uh, in a way that uh, the Sabiqun al-Avvaloon will be in the highest form of paradise. Next will be the Muttabiyunul Bil Ahsan and finally people who would follow them. So basically this, this division within this world would only signify or signal the fact that now they are, they are entitled to, 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 to their own place in, in paradise. But in this world, the reward that would, they would get is that of course they would be considered as companions of the Prophet and as such uh, they, are, uh, they have a very highly coveted place. But as far as the other two or three are concerned, the Mu'anidun, for example, the antagonists are, uh, as far as they are concerned, so they are generally put to death because they have taken lead. Uh, they are not just uh, silent observers. I mean, they are not waiting for their turn uh, to come and ignite the fire, but they have, they have come forth with an agenda. So they are put to death. And I just gave you the example of uh, Ka'ab bin Ashraf. This is an example that you can look up in history books and see how he was uh, tackled. Uh, so, uh, and then we have other, other categories, uh, for example, the, the next category is, is uh, let me see, the third, the, the, uh, the second category, which, uh, which, which is the category of, uh, oh, the Mutarabbisun, yeah, the people who, who, who are, in, I mean, who are trying to strike a compromise. So, they are warned, and in this world, they are warned that, well, you, you see that if you, are, if you would like to, uh, to, to, uh, to consider the truth from falsehood, it is, okay, it is fine. But ultimately, if you accept the truth, then that is going to be something which is going to augur well for you. So again, their, their own and the nature of their punishment is not going to be as strict uh, as the case uh, with the Mu'anidun. So remember the Mu'anidun, for them the initiative was taken and they were put to death. But this is not the case with the Mutarabbisun until that final punishment 
uh, which is destined to come, it arrives. So before the arrival of that punishment, they are, they are given this chance, which is not afforded to the, to the Mu'anidun. And the Zorafa and the Munafikun, of course, they are ones who are weak in faith and they again are warned and they are told that if they don't uh, come forward with the same, uh, I mean, if they have all the time in the world, but if they don't come forward before that final punishment is signaled from the Almighty, then they are also going to face the music. But one thing that you might uh, also uh, know, like to know uh, in the background of these three categories is that as far as Prophet Muhammad's nation is concerned, almost all of them accepted faith. So at the conquest of Mecca, we know that uh, as the Quran says, Yad khuluna fi din afwaja, that they accepted Islam in multitudes. Very few people remained, three or four people. Uh, they were people about whom the Almighty had directed Prophet Muhammad to have them killed, even if they are found hiding under the curtains of the Kaaba, as we know. So they were put to, that, uh, to death as well, like uh, Rafi and some of the other names that uh, you might be knowing. And they are all three or four in number. And the other person who was prominently killed was, was Kaab bin Ashraf. Uh, but other than that, in spite of the fact that uh, these idolaters were, I mean, they were, they were given this punishment of uh, death, it never actually took place because, as I said, almost all of them accepted Islam. Right, but the three months notice was given to the Mutarabbisin? Everyone. I mean, this was given to all those people. So as far as the, the four months, not three months, it was four months, it was given to all people with whom there was, there were, there were uh, uh, treaties who were, which were being made. So the, the, the four months notice which you have uh, read in Surah Tawbah, basically, it relates to the, to the tribes with whom those treaties were made that uh, once these treaties are, are uh, they, they reach their term, now they would have to uh, either face uh, the sword or they will be uh, spared only if they accept Islam. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Riyas. Please go ahead. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Sir. Wa alaikum salam. Dr. Sir, as you categorize that, I mean, Mu'adideen, I mean, so it means Abu Jahl and Hazrat Umar at one time was also in that category. So my question is, yes. Hazrat Umar, yes. uh, yeah, so Hazrat Umar accepted the Islam. Is it his own effort or it was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or it was both things? I think uh, this is this should be should remain clear uh, in our in our discussion that as far as accepting faith is concerned, it is I mean it's not that the will of God is, is governing their actions. It's it's never so. A person chooses his or her own destiny. A life of belief and disbelief is not the will of God. It is always the choice of a person. It's uh, what you can say is that it is in the knowledge of God. So God would know that which person is going to accept or which person is not going to accept. But his knowledge is not going to uh, have an effect on a person's destiny or life. The, a person's choice is the real thing here. So Umar chose out of his own accord that he, he came out of that age in which he had that uh, severe animosity against the Prophet. But Abu Jahl could not. So it was a personal choice. It's not that the Almighty willed that a person should be right or wrong. Uh, but is it true that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, he made the dua for both of them, that either one yes, of them... Yes, he did. Amr bin Hasham, yes, because both of, both of them were called, had the same common name. So he said that, well, uh, please uh, have them uh, in the ranks of Islam. He, he made this, this uh, prayer and we, have, we find this prayer mentioned in, in a lot of uh, books of biography of Prophet Muhammad. So th that prayer might have played a role. I mean, with you see, the prayer always plays a supportive role. It cannot pray. I mean, it co it cannot play a defining role. The defining role has to be from the person himself. Unless he has the will to go, how can a prayer can do do anything? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, MP Naveed Arfan. Please go ahead. Ji, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Daksab Mira Saval Heki, just a Sabekul and Avalin He, Ye Sabekun Akhrin Kabikuch Alfazang, a Quran Mikoy terminology is the use. There is no such term. So we have uh, in the Quran, we have just three categories a Sabekun, a Sabul Yamin, and a Sabu Shemal. Jazak. Adil Koreshi, please go ahead. Uh, sir, now that the era of the uh, prophets is over, 
uh what are the categories that remain today uh, in in this world now we only have people i mean is there any differentiation between sabikun versus zoafa versus munafikun these days we don't we don't because you see this is just the categorization in the lifetime of a messenger of god and these this categorization again is something which only god has i mean demarcated it's not that we can do that so uh, as far as uh, hypocrites are concerned remember it was only god who conveyed who a hypocrite was to a prophet to prophet muhammad because he was in no position to know the inner uh, self of a person so hypocrisy is something which is which relates to the heart so it was only in the times of god's messengers in which these categories they become apparent i mean they're always there they're, they're here and there everywhere in all times but they cannot be earmarked they cannot be demarcated and today of course uh, the category that we can have is just one i mean we have either believers or, or we have non believers so within the believers of course we have a category that we all know some believers they are very i mean they are very close to god they seem very close to god they are, they are always very very practicing in their deeds and in in their own words they are people who are who who match their own uh, deeds as well and there are others who who are maybe a little lazy in their practices but they're still uh, there so i mean they are they are slightly apparent as well in this regard but as far as the negative category is concerned we just cannot make out a hypocrite because as i said hypocrisy is something which relates to one's inner self and of that only god has any knowledge not even a prophet has a knowledge of a hypocrite so so sabikun still exist today but we just don't know only allah knows who they we are we just don't know them yeah yeah okay all right all these categories exist in fact but in the times of god's messengers they can be earmarked they can be demarcated we would know i mean the almighty would generally convey to his his messengers that well this is how things are i mean they are even today they are, they may be present but we don't have any means of knowing god's will remember in the times of god's messengers he he used to communicate to 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 people who were called messengers because of the fact he no longer communicates with any of us so in spite of the fact that these categories might be present we are not aware of them so we have to to i mean uh, make this these categories on the basis of our uh, on the basis of what we see or observe so either we are believers or we are non believers and both these categories they are self confessed thank you very much dr slim now we have a few to- on topic related questions so asif ali please go ahead assalam uh, alaikum dr sab waalaikum assalam uh, no this is actually the topic related uh, the question is that uh, the rewards and punishment or the last uh, i mean uh, rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam basically sent the letter to all the like uh, uh, big kingdoms around him and during the mm-hmm. second especially the hazrat umar era they they were get punished but when we see actually at that time one of the biggest uh, i mean kingdom or civilization was in subcontinent um, but we couldn't find in history that there is any messenger or any message was sent to them uh, as a as a last itmam e hujja and then get punished by any of the companion of the prophet why it was so you see the almighty chose areas which were adjacent to arabia if you make a list of those 12 uh kingdoms to which the letters were sent they were all on the edge and the border of arabia and they were uh, i mean they could visually see or actually uh, observe the itmamul hujja or the reward and punishment which was going to take place in arabia all the rest of the world was slightly at a distance so to me it seems that uh, the almighty actually act, uh, addressed only those nations through those letters of course the prophet being uh, addressing those nations through those letters uh, all of them were all adjacent areas i mean they were immediately very close and that is why we know from history that when once in the times of umar caliph umar people tried to step out of the boundaries of those 12 12 countries the, he was he stopped them he said that we we don't have the mandate because it is these categories to whom the reward and punishment or mamul hujja had become apparent in the lifetime of the prophet for kingdoms which were beyond these it never got communicated in such an ultimate way so remember this punishment or this uh, whole concept of mamul hujja can only materialize it with its consequences in places in which it can be observed 
And these were the places which were the border areas of Arabia. So, so that is why the subcontinent or I mean had the prophet written to the subcontinent in the first place he never wrote uh, obviously because of the, uh, on the behest of the Almighty because subcontinent was a far off place uh, in those times and uh, in all probability I mean they were not in a position to witness the day of reward and punishment within Arabia as was the case with the rest of the borderline, uh, the bordering nations. So, what will be the Atwamul Hujja for those where Rasulullah or anyone didn't wrote any letter or didn't do any reward and punishment? So, for them, there is no punishment in this world. So, remember, we have to understand that as far as Atwamul Hujja is concerned, it entails a worldly punishment for people who deny it. For others, their punishment is deferred to the Day of Judgment. I mean, for others, there is no such uh, punishment. It's like living in the post-prophetic era. So, for other people, they, are, they, are, they should know that their own reckoning is also going to come, but not in this world, in the hereafter. So, they have to learn a lesson from nations who got destroyed as a result of Itmam al Hujja, nations of Aad and Samud and the rest, and learn a lesson from them. So, it's not that every single, I mean, place in, on this earth uh, is a place where Itmam al Hujja has taken place and uh, where nations are going to be destroyed. No. Uh, as I said, these are areas only which are selected by the Almighty, the uh, prophets are sent to them, messengers are sent to them and they become a role model and I mean they become a model for the rest of the people to whom messengers might not be sent. So they can see that this, this is the fate that they are also going to witness but the only difference is that these nations they, undergone, they, they, they underwent this phase in this world but for the rest the fate has been deferred to the Day of Judgment. That is the only difference. Yes, uh, Doctor. Uh, yes, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Doctor, I'm now uh, talking about your translation uh, of Surah Fil. Uh, the Farai school believes uh, that uh, uses the word you pelted stones uh, at the elephants, while the traditional view is that it was the birds uh, that uh, God sent the Ababil that God sent, which uh, threw these uh, stones. Even Madhudi Sahib, while praising uh, uh, Imam Farai Sahib, uh, disagrees with this. What is your take on it, sir? I do agree with the, the Farai school absolutely uh, because of the because of the linguistic principles on the on the basis of which the tafsir is based, and also on the law of the Almighty that He only helps those who first uh, do whatever best they can. And as far as the linguistic principle is concerned, I mean, this is something that I can make uh, people who are not even aware of uh, Arabic, uh, how important it is to, to see that uh, the other interpretation cannot fit here. You see, the word Rama, which is Tarmihim, I mean, the root is Rama, is, is, is something which is spoken of, of an action which is done like this, I mean, like this. So, the birds don't have the power to do like this. All they can do is they, they carry the stones in their beaks or in their claws. So for them, it is, the, I mean, they drop stones. So the word Arabic, in the, the Arabic word for dropping is entirely different. But the Rama cannot be spoken for to drop something. To drop something has a different verb in Arabic. So to speak of, uh, of Rama, it has to have the force of your backhand. I mean, you have to do like this. So, so obviously a bird cannot do like this. It's just going to drop whatever it has, either in its beak or in, on its, in its claws. So that word is sufficient to tell us that it's absolutely inappropriate uh, to be spoken for the birds. I mean, this is one aspect. The other aspect is that the Almighty has made it clear in, his, uh, in, his, in the Quran that unless you and unless the people who are concerned, they make an effort, the Almighty is not going to add his uh, effort anywhere. Uh, look at what uh, you know, happened with the Israelites when they said uh, to Moses that, Fazab anta wa and you and your, your, your God go and fight with them. Inna ha huna qaidun. We are going to just sit here and, and look what happened to them. So the law which is apparent in the Almighty regarding his help is that people who are custodians of a certain message, they have to first do best what they can and then God Almighty is going to help them. And this is how it happened that the Quraysh actually pelted them in stones and when they, they could not we mean sufficiently make any uh, damage to the enemy armies. What the Almighty did was that he actually had a huge cyclone blown across that area in which those the pelted stones, they acquired a tremendous speed and momentum and then they, got, and they, and they struck those elephant 
uh, elephants and people who were riding them and other, other, other soldiers as well. So, I mean, I've just summarized uh, this. Uh, otherwise, I would advise you to look up some of the more detailed works that have been spoken and written uh, in the Tafsir of Surah Afil. Thank you very much, sir. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sleem. We have three more minutes. So, time for just one more question, which I'll read from the chat. So, this one asks, it taraf dunya artificial intelligence and artificial consciousness ki taraf bar rahi hai dusri taraf quran mein in depth utarne ki zarurat hai both need intensive amount of time a balanced way kya hai to do this for a person who is a jobia um and it continues like intellectual warfare ke liye science and technology mein bhi khud ko equip Hmm. I understand. I think this is a choice that a person has to make and it's a it's an era in which we have to specialize. I mean people who are going to specialize in science and AI related topics, they, they should first see whether they have that aptitude. And if they have the aptitude, they should take a decision in its uh, I mean to go along. Uh, on, on that path and others who are well versed and have an aptitude also an interest in in uh, the sciences of the Quran they are ones who should choose so so it's not the question of who doing what it's a question of who is made more appropriate for which task and people have to choose uh, according to their own ability and uh, and leave uh, some of the other things which they can which are they are not able to do to other people so it's like a it's like a dividing uh, amongst yourselves and choosing which is best for your own, uh, I mean, which suits your which suits your own aptitude and for which you can really uh, make a difference in the in, in the lives of people. Thank you very much, Dr. Sling. That was it for all of the questions. The session. <laughs>